So let me pray, and, uh, and then we'll try to... I have about... I had about eight or nine questions from this group, so I'm going to try to kind of go through those, and then obviously if there's questions about what I say about the questions, feel free to raise your hand, and then hopefully maybe we'll even have some time for some of y'all who have questions and then get to write them down um, to ask questions as well. So, um, And I guess, and I'll... I mean, if y'all have things, I can push this around uh, if you're still not wanting to ask a question and, and it be anonymous, so I'll just pass this around. I'm going to just keep passing it until it comes back up to me. And if so you all have an index card with a question, we can hopefully try to get to it. But like I said, we do have eight questions, so eight or nine questions, so hopefully we'll get through them all. Um, so let me pray and then we'll get started. Holy Father, I thank you for this great week. Uh, I pray that everyone in here um, had a great week. I know we're a little tired at the end of the week, and uh, just pray that you'll kind of wake us up here for these next uh, couple uh, sessions. Um, as we continue to just kind of learn about you and reflect on, on who you are in your gospel. And I just pray um, that you'd be with all of us um, and that you'd give everyone in here a safe trip home tomorrow. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right, and, and just so you know, like, I'm not like trying to become like the Mr. Answer Man or anything. Um, and, and so I'm going to kind of, uh, kind of answer these questions. That doesn't mean I'm saying like, oh, I know it, you know, I know, I know all or... Um, and that's man, but I'm going to try to like kind of think biblically and critically about about these questions, and um, and definitely you know, if love for for y'all. I mean, not saying y'all have to agree with me or anything. Love for y'all to go and take this back to your youth leaders and stuff like that, and continue to talk about and dialogue about these things. And so here, um, so the first question I got uh, from y'all this hour uh, was about church, and um, I'm mean, finding a church. And then also kind of um, a few about do we need church um, or how do we deal with a friend who just thinks it can be them and Jesus in the woods or you know, just them and Jesus. They don't really need the church. And so that's the first thing I wanted to talk about. Um, and obviously, uh, since when we talked about identity, purpose, and brokenness, uh, one of my, uh, I think, big themes throughout, uh, obviously the first day was our identity in Christ, but the second day was our purpose. And talked about work, rest, and relationships, and so obviously the relationship aspect of that is a big deal, and I would say that purpose is most clearly shown in the church, and then yesterday we talked about brokenness, and I, I tried to always talk about how, um, show that we need a community that can come and heal brokenness, and we need people together to heal brokenness, and, and so that's kind of... Uh, the talk, I think that uh, in our kind of individualist society, we sometimes don't think we need the church, but we really do. Um, we really do need it. We need other believers. We need a Christian fellowship. And, um, and there's uh, various reasons for that. This where's my pen. Uh, one is that um, I think, and, and this will come back to a lot of the questions uh, that y'all asked me, um, but, you know, we, I guess... In RUF, and I would say with RYM as well, um, and most of y'all youth pastors, they believe in the, that there's a primary means of grace, which basically means these are practices, these are habits that allow that that, gear, that that are guaranteed to have the Holy Spirit being active in your life, and and for y'all to be transformed um, in grace, you know, and you know, of course, these are kind of the obvious things. And we get this in like Acts 2 um, and throughout Acts actually and then elsewhere in Ephesians and other places but uh, sacraments and fellowship. Um, you know and then sometimes you could put worship in there but I would, I would put worship with like biblical lyrics put with fellowship singing. Um, but these are kind of the four primary means of grace and I would say that like when these things are together uh, that the Holy Spirit is active. And, and I would say if you're taking out this part, um, you're, in, you're in really big trouble because we need people and we are created for people. And if you remember Genesis 2 that we read, said that it was not good for man to be alone. And, and, and that wasn't talking about just your relationship with Jesus, the vertical relationship, but the horizontal relationship matters as well. And I would, you know, again say that we need, uh, we need people and, and for y'all, finding a church is going to be hard. Uh, often it is hard in college. And for me, my freshman year, I didn't even have a car. 
So I just had to find people who were going to church. And, um, and so that meant a lot of work on my end. For somebody who never, whose parents just made him go to church, to all of a sudden wake up one day and realize, one, I now could sleep in if I wanted to and not go to church. Um, but then two, that I can't just, even if I like slept late, I had to do the, the work of finding somebody to give me a ride, um, getting there on time so that they would, you know, wouldn't have already left. And so it was actually a lot more effort than it had in the past for me to go to church. And if you all know uh, the college lifestyle and, what, and having people hanging out Saturday nights, that can be a very difficult thing to do. Of course, now there's also a lot of Sunday afternoon and evening services popping up as well, so that's sometimes helpful um, for people who struggle to get up. But, um, but, but so what I would say is, you know, don't feel like you have to find a church immediately, um, but you need to, you know, in other words, find the one church for you in whatever you're going to college, but you need to find a church and you don't need to delay it and procrastinate it because I do think that's really important. And then I also think it's, as I said earlier, vitally important that you find a Christian fellowship if you don't um, on your campus. I think that's really important. Um, or find a local church with a, you know, um, with with Christians um, that are your peers that are in college too because college is a really unique time and I think it's really beneficial for you to be. Uh, be in a community of other college students. And so obviously that's why I promote RUF, but there's also a lot of other great uh, campus ministries out there as well. Um, and I would just say you need to go and get involved in that. Um, but one of the big things uh, is that we tend to s- want to stick with community until it, until it fails um, or until it gets awkward. And, you know, it used to be in the old days there was like one church in a town, and if it was like, you know, a Baptist church, but you are a Methodist, Presbyterian, Catholic, uh, you name it, you just sucked it up and went to that church, you know, and, and wondered maybe one day your denomination would come through and plant a church in that town, and, and, and people were a lot less. But today, we're kind of much more consumeristic about church and kind of expect, uh, we have this kind of, I think, um, poor expectation of churches wanting are going to come and basically, uh, you know, entertain us and give us everything we need and everybody's going to be perfect to us and nobody's going to be awkward and people aren't going to be, you know, demand anything of us and it's just going to be easy and the preaching's going to be great and the music's going to be great and all these things. And that church just never exists. It doesn't exist. The perfect church doesn't exist. Um, and uh, I have a couple quotes from Kevin Twitt, who's a campus minister at Belmont. Um, if you know a lot of the songs we sang in Double Grace, um, he's produced a lot of uh, Double Grace music and things like that. Um, and he says this. He says, um, Community is not a commodity dispensed by the church. It is something we experience to the extent that we intentionally involve ourselves in each other's lives. In other words, um, while I really want, and every year in RUF at U, you know, UT Chattanooga, we have a leadership retreat, and I, you know, we try to get our students as you know, to reach out as best they can to students, um, you know, but at the end of the day, we're, we're not going to take, you know, we're not going to put a gun to somebody's head and make them come to RUF. Um, and we're not going to, like, force, and, and at least I'm not, I know other ministries put pressure on, but RUF's very much a, you can come to us as much as you want, we really want you to come to everything, but we're not going to force you to. Um, and, and so it is very much, you know, y'all have to be intentional, you have to actually show up to things um, I think you will be invited to stuff, um, but you can't kind of expect um, to have your hand held uh, throughout college. And I don't think y'all want that. That's why y'all going to college. Um, but we just have to realize that we have to intentionally involve ourselves in other people's lives. For most of y'all, if you look at most of your friendships, they've just kind of happened. Uh, they've just kind of happened like they just happen to be, you know, they're, you know, your parents' friends have kids. You hung out with them all the time. You went to high school with these people. Um, you spend day in, day out with them, and you eventually find certain people that you like hanging out with more than others. And one of the hard parts about going to college is um, you do have a lot of people that you come in that are friends, but oftentimes you're in this new place, and there's all these people that don't know you, and you have to actually put yourself out there and, like, pursue people or decide to go out with people you know, to eat out with people you don't really know that well. And it can be kind of weird because a lot of y'all have never done that before. And so you kind of have to intentionally do it. Um, and as far as, if y'all have your Bibles, if you turn with me to Ephesians 2, as far as kind of the sense of, I don't really need the church, it can just be God and me. You know, me and Jesus. 
I just want to read something from Ephesians 2 because Paul um, seems pretty passionate about the church in Ephesians. And so if you have a friend who's struggling with wanting to go to church, I would tell them to go through Ephesians with you. Um, but specifically Ephesians 2, uh, starting in verse 11, and he's talking, uh, he's talking here to, to Gentiles, um, to basic people who are outsiders who become Christians in the church in Ephesus. And he says, Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in flesh, <clears throat> look at that voice cracking, called the, uh, still going through puberty apparently, um, <laughs> called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision. In other words, you were called outsiders by the Jewish people. Um, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, strangers to all these things, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For He Himself is our peace, um, who has made us both one and has broken down in His flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Okay, and He's not talking about between us and God there. He's talking about between Gentiles and Jewish people, between each other. Um, by abolishing the law of commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. So making peace. In other words, a bunch of people unifying a bunch of people together. That's one of the th reasons why Christ uh, died on the cross and was raised. And he might reconcile us to both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Okay? So, for you to not be a part of the church is basically saying, basically you're saying, I know Christ had to die for a lot of stuff, but I'm just going to take the, like, saved part. And I don't want all the benefits that come with Christ dying on the cross for me. I don't want to take all these things, and I want to kind of ignore the bulk of the New Testament, which, by the way, are letters written to churches, not to individuals. And... and you know, and how, if I'm not part of a church, you know, am I going to really show fruit of the Spirit? Am I going to really bear other people's burdens? And so we need to be part of a community and part um, of a fellowship. We need other people. And this kind of gets at a little bit um, to the next question uh, that you all had, which was some people, when I uh, drew, drew the iceberg chart yesterday about uh, how we have all this unknown sin that hasn't even been revealed to us yet. And, and so a, few of a couple of y'all asked, how do we know about this unknown sin? And again, one of the main reasons, the answer to that would be, be in fellowship with people. Be in a church under a pastor of some sort. You know, under pastoring, under, you know, staff leaders, youth pastors, senior pastors, um, you know, campus ministers, um, and talk to them and just begin to dialogue with them. And, and uh, you know, if you really want people to tell you what your sin is, usually people will oblige. Um, and, uh, you know, usually your friends will let you know, um, you know, some of your flaws and weaknesses. And honestly, and, and part of it is, and for some of y'all, I, I, I sense kind of in your questions this fear of like, oh, I'm doing all these things and I don't know about it, and that's kind of driving you crazy. Um, and what I would say is, well, guess what? Now you get to rest in grace and stop trying to be perfect. Um, and, and so it's kind of a question of uh, we need to rest in grace and we need to, as we go along, and, and, continue, you know, and if you want to pray for God to reveal your sin to you, um, definitely I'm all for that. And you need to like, begin to understand uh, you know, why you do the things you do. Um, but the biggest, I think, right here, means of grace. The more you read the Bible, the more you pray, um, taking the Lord's Supper, being baptized, hanging out in fellowship, you're going to start to more and more see some of your sin patterns, some of your habits. Um, it's going to happen. And, uh, and RUF kind of has a buzz term that we call meta-thinking. And what we talk about is that means always asking the question, why? Why we do the things we do? And, and a lot of it, with the, the first time we met and I talked about identity in Christ, I had, gave you all a bunch of questions 
course, y'all don't get the sheets till Wednesday, but I put a bunch of questions on what do you put your identity in? And I think when you start to think about those kind of questions, why you do what you do, what you're putting your identity in, you're going to begin to see a lot of your sin patterns and your motivations um, that you might not have seen. Because sometimes you can do the right things, but for the wrong reasons. And, and that's kind of what I would say. You know, um, you know, another way of looking at it is, is a lot of times we like to think, of the Christian life as we, we figure out our bad behavior and then we try like as hard to make it into, our, into good behavior. So we're like, a lot of people think this is a Christian life. Find out about my bad behavior and now we need you know, to shift over to good behavior. Um, but the problem is when we do that, we tend to leave Christ out of, the, out of the equation and then we also tend to just dwell on external obvious sins. And so really, what I like to look at is, and we don't have time there, but if you wanted to turn to Galatians um, 4 and 5, you could see what they talk about, which is the fruit of the flesh, which people don't actually talk about a lot, and then the fruit of the Spirit. So you have the fruit of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. And it's not about going from here to here. It's about when you're starting to see simple patterns, you start to ask the question, why? You know, or, you know, what am I actually worshiping? What, what am I actually putting my identity in? And then, and then you begin to see, you know, idols, you know, false stories you're believing. Uh, you begin to see, you know, uh, basically, you know, sinful patterns, and, and you're more looking at your heart. And when you do that, you can begin to see, uh, you know, that, that you've been given a new heart, a new identity in Christ. And Christ, tends, Christ fulfills typically these things and, and the truth. And then you'll begin to see that you'll have spirit. And so you end up doing that. And so in other words, so I'm, I'm going to be, you know, sorry I'm always harping on these kind of sins, but like gossip, for instance. You see a lot of gossip in your life. And so what I would say is, what are the false stories you're believing? And a lot of it is, I want to be an insider. You know, my identity, I need to be approved by people. I need to be an insider, not on the outside. That's what's driving you. Or you're believing the false stories, that, that, that that'll bring happiness, when really all that gossip does is it makes people not trust you. And, and so, because if you've ever thought about, well, I really want to talk to somebody about this, but then in the back of your mind, you always say, well, I heard them talking about what so-and-so said to them, and I don't want to be that person, so I'm not going to tell them. And all of a sudden, you have this cycle of nobody, everybody having walls up and nobody talking to people. And so you have sinful patterns. And if you begin to see that, the real story is that Christ made you an insider eternally. So it doesn't matter if you're an outsider. So you can be a little more bold in talking to people about what you're going through. And you don't have to talk to other people, you don't have to talk about other people to make yourself look better because your identity is in Christ. You already are seen as perfect. And when you begin to think that way and have a new heart, you'll begin to show some fruit of the Spirit. Um, and, you know, it's just funny because I remember uh, a female student of mine um, that came in uh, the other day uh, once uh, met with me and she said, you know, I've been hanging out with all my friends, you know, for about two months now, and I've realized we never, the only thing we ever do is talk about other people. We never even talk about ourselves. We just, all our conversations talk about other people. And I mentioned that, and I said, well, let's just talk about what we're going through. And then it was like two minutes of awkward silence, and they all kind of laughed. Um, and I think it's so easy for us to get in these patterns of gossip. And, I mean, I'll just throw it out there, you know. Uh, you know, porn. So, lust of the flesh and what, what's happening there a lot of times it's idols and we begin to look at our motivations and what porn really does because people look at porn because they think it's going to make them feel better but it always makes you feel worse a lot of times people do it because they're lonely but it only leads to more loneliness because you're interacting with an unreal two dimensional person as opposed to actually interacting you know, with real people and real humans that can actually give you fellowship when you begin to see the false story 
of pornography and how, and how it objectifies men and women, you'll begin to see that Christ fulfills that need of loneliness, that Christ can bring you intimacy that pornography never will. And you begin to then have fruit of the spirit of love instead of lust. Does that make sense at all? So that's just like one way of looking at, um, at, at kind of unknown sin and kind of figuring out what's going on with you. Um, and, uh, and like I said, uh, if you are living in the midst of a, of a Christian community, you're going to see more and more of your sin. That's going to happen. Um, if you're under good preaching, if you're with, with your friends and you, you're beginning to tear down walls and be honest and real with each other, you're going to see that stuff. Um, and so... Um, and that just says you need pastors. And, and I'll say this, and, you know, I, don't, I, can't, I can't say that pastors or youth pastors or campus ministers are going to be perfect, um, but what I want to say this is that um, your pa- youth pastor, he or she knows, um, they're, they believe in, in the gospel. And so they know that you're a sinner, and they know that we all have things that are hidden. And, and they are youth pastors because they want to love on y'all and they want to show grace. If you can't talk to them, I don't know who you can talk to. And so I really encourage y'all, um, you know, some of y'all, y'all might be about to go into college, I encourage y'all to talk to interns and campus ministers and staff people, um, but you can talk to youth pastors. I think we have a fear. I just, it's always funny, every year, you know, freshmen come to me and they want to, like, kind of show their, like, you know, Christian resume to me. You know, and I'm always like, I don't care about all that stuff. You know, the only thing I know about you is you're a sinner. And so I don't mind if you tell me you're, you're, you're junk in your life, because I expect that. And I'm here for you because the rest of the world works on merit. Only the Christian community works on grace. And so I just want to, you know, push on y'all to go talk to people about the stuff you're going through. Be honest uh, with your youth leaders about everything you're going through. They're the best people I think you can possibly talk to. Okay, so let's move quickly to the next question. Um, just kind of a question about witnessing in class. Um, it's being a witness in class. And, and I just would say, you know, going back to our purposes of work, rest, and relationships, I honestly, I think the best way you can witness is just by being a good student and a good classmate. You know, not being the annoying person in the group project that nobody can ever get a hold of and shows up late to all your meetings. Um, you know, not being the person that skips half your classes that your their professor's frustrated with, that's always calling, asking for extensions all the time because you procrastinated things. Um, but then, but then, I, you know, but participate in class. And there's some days, you know, I, I wouldn't always say that it's a good thing for, you know, because you end up having a lot of people get up and be like, I'm a Christian, and I'm going to make in my project this class to defend whatever this professor's saying, you know, and, and you can kind of be seen as a little obnoxious then. Um, but there are times when you have to be honest about where you're coming from and who you are. And so, like, when I took a medieval philosophy class, all we were talking about, because all, you know, medieval philosophy is all based kind of coming from Christianity. And so it became very apparent that I was a Christian in my class and that other people weren't. And, you know, and that was fine. Um, but then other classes, you just, you know, are answering questions and, and being part of the discussion. You don't always have to have, you know, say, well, I'm a Christian and I believe this. You don't always have to do that. Um, but I would say, and I would also say, you know, think of classes as you have an entire semester. And so you have a large body of work with which to witness. You don't have to, like, you know, jump out at people all the time. But, and for some of you all go to classes, you are going to find professors who are anti-Christian and who are going to attack Christianity. And I think the best thing you all can do is be good listeners and, and feel free to debate the professor. Um, but also, and, and honestly, but be, be also know that, like, you prob- he or she will probably win because they've been doing that for 30 years and you're a freshman or sophomore in college and, um, and that's okay and then, you, and then find your campus minister find your friends, talk about stuff um, but it's okay to enter into those debates and it's okay to be challenged on your faith, I think, I think being challenged on your faith actually strengthens your faith so, so I think all those things are fine, I don't know if I answered that well but um, and the and then I had another question about listening to a friend or being a witness to a friend giving advice. And, and it's kind of what I talked about yesterday. And I just wanted to say that um, I'm not saying don't ever give friends advice or don't ever um, help, you know, find a solution to people. I'm just saying that what I've found is that most people, somebody's going through something and you 
stay away from going to them because you, know, you think to yourself, I don't really have an answer for that. Like, I don't really know what to say to that person. And, and I've found that just going and being with them and listening is, is huge. That most of the time people don't necessarily want to be fixed um, immediately. They just want people to be with them. You know, I found that as a pastor, you know, one of the most frightening things for me as a pastor um, was having to do funerals and visit people in hospitals and do things like that. And, and that was one of the things I always was wrestled with is like, I don't have anything to, to give them. I can't help this family. They've lost somebody or they're, they're deathly ill. I have nothing to do. And what I found more over and over and over again is they just want somebody to sit and talk with them. They didn't want answers. You know, they just wanted somebody to sit and be with them to either celebrate a lost life um, or just to hang out with them while they're feeling bad. And so that's all I was kind of saying is like we need to be quick to listen, uh, quick to be with people. But then, yeah, for sure offer advice, especially out of your own experiences. Um, just don't always be like quick to do that. Um, but definitely uh, do that if it's at all possible. Okay, um, Here's a question on marrying in college. By the way, if you have questions about what I'm saying, you can feel free to raise your hands. Sorry. Um, marrying in college. I'm all for marrying in college. Um, I'm also all for not marrying in college. Um, and, and what I would say to that is that uh, you know, here's what the Bible says about marriage. It's, an, it's a covenant, um, which means it's an official commitment which means once you make a commitment in marriage, you've committed. And then all of a sudden your feelings and things like that are less important. So in other words, you've made what is subjective, you know, love, romance, and you've made it objective. In other words, I'm now committing to this person in sickness and in health um, and, in, and in being annoying and not being annoying and, and all those other things. And, and it's a covenant. And, but what the Bible says about marriage is, it says you need to marry, if you're a believer, you need to marry a believer. You need to be yoked with a believer. So they have to be a believer. And when I say, when I say believer, and, and obviously, again, I'm not one who sits up and like says you're a believer, you're not a believer type of thing. But what I mean is you need to both be practicing Christians. And when I say practicing Christians, what I usually mean is are you engaging in this? You know, are you, are you somebody who um, is part of a Christian fellowship, is part of you know, reads the Bible or has the Bible taught to them, prays, are you a practicing Christian? The practicing Christians need to marry other practicing Christians. The other one, so this is when people come and ask me if I'll marry them. I say, you both have to be practicing Christians. Secondly, uh, you have to like each other. Um, you'd be amazed how many people don't really actually like each other when you sit them down. Why are you getting married? Y'all, don't, y'all hate each other. Um, and then thirdly, you want, you want to have sex with each other. Um, and so some of you are laughing. What do you mean people want to get married and they don't like each other and they don't want to have sex with each other? You would be amazed how many, of the, how many people do not qualify for all three of those things. So that, in other words, there are a lot of times either, sometimes because of some past things or other things that like, you know, that people really, they, they enjoy the person as a friend, but they don't really want to have sex with them at all. So they don't think of them in that way. Or they don't really like each other. Um, you know, or they're not believers. But those are the three qualities that I see, you know, in stuff like Ephesians 5, 1 Corinthians 7, other places. And so those are the requirements. But um, what the Bible doesn't say is you have to have a good job, you have to be out of college. Um, it doesn't say you have to be established. It doesn't say that you have to have played the field or dated other people first. Um, that's, the Bible doesn't say that. No, your parents say that. But that's not in the Bible. Um, and that doesn't say that some of the things they're saying aren't unwise. Um, and so what I would say is, uh, I think it's fine to get married in college, um, but I also would say you need to have a real engagement, you need to not elope, um, and things like that, because, um, because you, know, for some, you, know, you might want to um, give it some time to see if you really want to do this, because 1920 is really young to get married. But I have, I have a lot of married students at UTC, over the years, I've married students, and I think it's been fine. I actually think, especially for guys, it actually makes them much better students and way more responsible. Um, you, don't, you don't play Call of Duty for 12 straight hours when you're married. Um, and uh, uh, so, I'm, so, so I'm fine with that. Uh, but I would say definitely, you know, um, that, 
you know, I, I would be somebody who would want to at least, you know, see what happens your freshman year because a lot of people change your freshman year. Um, you know, if you're in a long distance relationship, especially, a lot of times that can be very clarifying for people on whether they really like each other or not. Um, so, I don't know, do you have any questions about that, about being, getting married um, with that? Um, uh, the one thing that I would say, though, is you can get married in college, but you should not act married in college if you're not married. Because that's really, most dating relationships end up becoming relationships where you just act married, um, and you're like living pseudo-marriages and playing house, and that's very destructive. And that can be sexually, that can be emotionally, um, that can just be in like the amount of time you spend. Um, and, and that's one thing I tell people, when you're dating, you should never spend more time with the person you're dating than you should with your other friends. If your like, guy or girlfriends are complaining that you're spending too much time uh, with the person you're dating, they are 99.9% .9 usually right. And you should listen to them. Um, because, uh, because what you're doing is you're playing at marriage. And like, like people, college boyfriends and girlfriends hang out more than married people do with each other. Um, and I think it's very unhealthy. Uh, and, and like married people, you know, that's, you know, and the other thing is, um, I want to tell you all is marriage does not cure your problems. You've not arrived when you get married. It's not the cure to happiness. Um, you know, it's funny. The only people that think uh, marriage, uh, you know, will satisfy them are people that are unmarried. Married people don't believe that because they're married. Um, and, uh, and, that, and that does, I think marriage is great. I love being married. But it does not solve your problems. It does not, uh, it's, you know, you still need friends outside of your marriage. You obviously still need the gospel. You still need Jesus. Um, and so just throwing that out there on that. Um, okay. Let me see. Uh, drinking. Drinking. Sorry, I'm running through these things. Uh, so alcohol. So we got asked, um, you know, is drinking really a big deal? Is alcohol really a big deal? Um, so... And, uh, and I think that's a great question. Um, and it's something that I think this is probably the more obvious. This is what everybody struggles with in college. And it seems like, you know, drinking is just prevalent. Uh, drinking alcohol is prevalent. And, um, and let me say that, uh, uh, that the Bible, I believe, is pro-alcohol. Uh, that there are like something like 200-something references to alcohol that are positive, And then there are only about 40 that are negative. And so, um, so I'm here to say alcohol is a positive thing, but I'm here to say the Bible is unequivocally clear that drunkenness is evil and drunkenness is a sin. Um, and I'll just read, you know, 1 Peter 4, uh, 3, um, 3 and 4. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, take drinking keg parties um, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. And that's kind of what I talked about yesterday when I talked about you're not really loving people uh, when you're drunk. And here, uh, right here, Peter just does it for me, connects that um, with talking about drunkenness and orgies and drinking parties, and then connects it to, um, you know, but be sober-minded and love each other. In other words, you cannot be loving each other and also be drunk. Um, and so basically what it's saying here is that when you're gratifying um, the flesh, you know, to use that kind of biblical language, you're not loving people. You cannot be drunk and love your neighbor as yourself. And again, Christianity is about relationships. And so it's not about God doesn't want you to be drunk, uh, you know, because that would be fun and it's great. It's, it's God doesn't want you to be drunk because you don't love people when you're drunk. You can't walk when you're drunk, you know? Um, uh, Proverbs actually, Proverbs 23, which is pretty funny, says this. Um, Proverbs says, be not among drunkards or among gluttonous eaters of meat. Oh, by the way, gluttony is just as big of a deal as drunkenness, by the way. Um, so I'm not trying to make... But the question is about alcohol, so I'm talking about it. Um, who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? Who has wounds without cause? And so I'm laughing because I'm thinking of like a party I was at in high school. Um, 
you know, where a bunch of people were drunk, and then the police came, and then, like, you know, a guy, like, tried to jump over a fence and ended up, like, slicing opening his leg like this. And, and then he was like, dude, look at this. Look at all my blood. This is awesome. You know, because he was drunk. And, of course, for the next, like, four days, he was in unbearable pain. Um, uh, but because he was drunk, he couldn't even, like, do anything. And he actually thought some, how he'd hurt his body was cool. See, this is what happens to us uh, when we're drunk. You know, uh, it says, Who has redness of eyes? Those who tarry long over wine, uh, those who go to try mixed wine, uh, do not look at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup and goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. Um, See hangover. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart utter perverse things. You will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea, like one who lies on the top of a mast. In other words, you'll feel seasick. Again, um, you know, being drunk, hungover, dizzy, um, you know. And so, and so, in a sense, drunkenness, you're escaping from reality. And one of the things that Christianity is all about because of creation is it calls us not to escape from reality. It calls us to enjoy the creation. To enjoy here. Not try to escape or numb ourselves away from what is real. And that's what drunkenness does. And so we're supposed, the Bible calls us, um, when we're 21, I'm going to talk about it in a second, that we can feast and celebrate with alcohol things on earth, like weddings, feasts, you know, end of a school year, whatever. Feasts and celebrations are what for alcohol f- are for, but not to get drunk, to do it in moderation. And, uh, and so you lose your inhibitions. And, and I'm telling you, I've, I've had to deal, uh, you know, with doing college ministry. I've had to deal with a lot of really hurt and horrible situations for people that I would say, you know, you know good Christian students because of alcohol, um, you know, did things sexually they didn't want to or taken advantage of um, by others. And it's just all this sort of pain that occurs. You know, and I get so frustrated because I'll have a guy tell me it doesn't matter, you know, that he, that he gets drunk. And then I'm like, it does matter because you're a total jerk to girls when you get drunk. And you did some things that you should not have done. You know, and we might have to go talk to the police about these things. And so I really want to caution y'all about drunkenness. And for all of y'all, you're fine. You don't even think about this until you're 21 because y'all shouldn't be drinking because that's the law of the land. And Paul makes it very clear in Romans 13 uh, that that's the case. Um, I don't have time to read it, but y'all go to Romans 13, 1 through 4. Um, so God, in His infinite providence and wisdom, even though you might be mad at Him about it, puts you in a country where the drinking age is 21. And that means you're not to drink until you're 21 because we're called to follow the law of the land. Um, and I've seen that if we don't do this, we begin to not trust authority. And when we don't trust the authority of the land, we will end up not trusting the authority of God, which is the Bible. And, and I've, like, I've yet to find anybody who drinks under 21 that has grown closer to Jesus because of it. I just, I've been doing ministry for 15, 16 years. I just haven't seen it. Um, and, and so we're called to follow, um, to be under the law of the land. And I, I don't care if it's a stupid law. A lot of my friends think it's a stupid law. The drinking age should be 18. Um, but you know what? Until you turn 18, you can't vote about it. Um, and I don't think it's going to change the next three, four years. So you all y'all just need to deal with it, is what, is what I would say. And, um, and, and honestly, I think it's a great place to learn how to interact with people without drinking. Because one of the things I've found about people who drink under 21 is then they have struggled to have any like, kind of social conversations with people at parties or places unless they have alcohol in their system. They're so used to using it to kind of calm their, their, their like, awkwardness and, and calm their nerves down. And so it's a great chance to be able to get mature and actually be able to talk to people and hang out with people without the need for doing uh, alcohol or drugs to make it better. So just saying that. And, um, you know, by the way, and if, and if you do drink, and if you have, you know, if you do drink when you're under 21, don't go and have a party when you turn 21. That's like the, it's like the most annoying, hypocritical thing for me in the world. It's like, <laughs> I've drank every weekend for my whole college career, but now I'm going to have a big blowout when I turn 21. Nothing has changed. <laughs> Why are we throwing a big party when you're 21? You've already been drinking your whole college career. It's like a total hypocritical move. Um, but I just would impassion y'all like seriously it's just not drinking for like two or three years of your life 
It's not a big deal. Um, and I also think the people who waited, they, they have a much more mature understanding of how to deal with alcohol when they turn 21. Um, I've really seen that. Um, I know most of y'all probably in here have messed up, and so that's fine, and God's grace covers all that. But I'm just saying it's not good. The, the lie you tell yourself is I'm not hurting anybody, and it's not a big deal. And what I'm telling you is you're doing something that is a community killer and not loving to your neighbor. Like, and that is the truth. So that's what I should say about alcohol. Um, okay, sorry, we're running out of time here. Uh, I, want, I do want to talk about homosexuality. Um, if any of y'all, uh, I did a big um, seminar about homosexuality this last year at UTC. Um, this is my email address, uh, jcraft at ref.org. If you send me your email, I'll try to send you that handout. Um, if you're really, if this is like a topic you're very, very interested in. Um, and I just want to say a couple things about homosexuality because I think it kind of is a big issue of our day. Um, and uh, one I want to say is if, if, you, um, if you have same-sex attraction in here, um, I just want to apologize to you because the church has been a ter- done a terrible job of dealing with you. Um, and I want to apologize to you for you know, having to sit around youth groups that use terms like, that's so gay and things like that. And I apologize... Um, for you on that, and I hope that we start, stop doing those sorts of things um, to people. Um, but I just want to say a couple things about the homosexuality, and that's, um, here's my eraser, that, that we need to start, I think, having better categories than just somebody's homosexual and somebody's not. And, and the categories, I would say, are same-sex attraction, I know my handwriting is illegible, so sorry about that. Um, sexual orientation. And then sexual identity. And if you all were here Tuesday, you would know that I have a very, very, very big problem with that right there. Because our identity is not supposed to be in who we're attracted to or who we have sex with. Our identity is supposed to be in Christ. And, and I think that... Um, we shouldn't use the term a homosexual. I think we should begin to think people, uh, do, are they attracted to the same sex? Um, because some people are attracted to the same sex, but also attracted to the opposite sex, but they have some of this in their lives. Some people are sexual orientation. So like I have a, I have a couple of people in our ministry right now in RUF, never, never been attracted to the opposite sex ever in their lives. Um, always been attracted to the same sex. And I would say that their sexual orientation um, is towards the same sex. So it's not just that they're attracted, uh, but that they're basically their entire kind of orientation with how they think romantically is about the same sex. Um, but then thirdly, I think that people can make it into their identity, and it's about it's all what they're about. And I would say um, I would struggle with this. Uh, in, if you're a Christian, you cannot make your identi- uh, entire identity into your sexuality. Um, and, and one of the reasons I want to do this is because the Bible does not condemn this. The Bible does not condemn that. The Bible condemns homosexual practices. If you look at all the verses in the New Testament and Leviticus um, and Romans, um, that what we have over and over and over again is homosexual practices being condemned. So what that means is, um, is that a homosexual, people who are sexually oriented to the same sex are, are called to chastity, just like people who are um, sexually oriented towards uh, the opposite sex are called to chastity, except in marriage. Unfortunately, the Bible um, will only let a man and a woman marry, and that goes back to Genesis 1 and 2 and, and what marriage is supposed to be, and I don't have time to get into all of that. Uh, but And so that's so what I would say is people who are struggling with homosexuality are, the same, are in the same exact spot at, at the other people in the world who are struggling with heterosexuality. Um, y'all all in here, I don't know how many of y'all are, I don't think any of y'all high school students are married. Y'all are all called by the Bible to be chaste, to be practicing chastity, to not be sexual uh, with other people. So there really is no difference between you and people who are struggling with homosexuality. 
Um, and there's no difference if you're, a homo- if you're struggling with homosexuality, there's no difference between you and people who are struggling with hom- heterosexuality. Um, the hard thing, the hard thing um, for those who are um, sexually oriented to the same sex is that, um, is that you do not um, have an outlet for that because the Bible um, uh, does not support marriage that's not between a man and a woman. Um, and I don't have time, obviously, to get into all the Bible verses to prove that. And, um, and, but I'll just say this. Uh, Wesley Hill, if you want to know more about this, uh, a guy named Wesley Hill, who is a, um, is a Christian pastor who is oriented uh, to the same sex um, in his attractions, wrote a book called Washed and Waiting, which I think is an excellent book. And in it, he gives a very honest, um, thorough uh, basically discussion of why he's decided um, to continue to follow traditional, uh, the traditional Christian understanding and, and just stay um, and not marry and, and, and practice chastity his whole life. And, um, and, and one of the main reasons he gives is it worked for Jesus. It worked for Paul. Um, those guys never got married. Jesus didn't get married. And he's the son of God. And he's what we're all supposed to long to uh, achieve do you still get married? Did I say again that marriage does not solve all your problems or make you somehow better? Yes, I did. Jesus never got married. Paul never got married. A lot of the disciples were not married. Um, you don't need to be married. Um, Mary Magdalene, I don't believe, ever got married. There's a lot of people in Scripture that did not get married. And that's okay. We have an idolatry of marriage both in our churches and in America. Um, do you all have questions about that? Because that's like a, be- a very intense topic I just talked about for five seconds. Um, um, but I'll say this is, yes? Um, so the Bible says if you group multiply, how are we supposed to do that? Or not? Yes. And that's what I would say. Um, as for, uh, that would be through, um, I think, expanding the kingdom through being witnesses. You know, I think that so much of multiplying now looks more, um, you know, that can be applied greater to churches just as it can to having, having babies. Um, you know, to being part of more churches planting, more, you know, the kingdom expanding, more people coming into church, more people knowing uh, Christ, and also just multiplying God's image, healing the brokenness of the world. Um, because I think sometimes, especially in the South, in Christian circles, um, in kind of the Bible Belt, we just kind of think of that to live life, to like have like a real life, we have to like be married and have kids. And that just, I mean, the Bible doesn't teach that. In fact, Paul goes, you know, and, and you know, actually says, you know, I don't know why y'all, you know, I guess if you're going to burn with passion, you should get married. But like for me, I'm fine not being married. Um, so the New Testament is very clear that like marriage is great, but singleness is great as well. Um, and I'm not saying, I mean, and what I'm saying is very, very, very hard. And, and for someone who is sexually oriented to the same sex, um, that is a horrible thing to tell them. That desire may never be satiated uh, in your life. I mean, that's like a horrible thing to talk about, especially for somebody who's married. Um, you know, it's, it's, it feels very terrible to say that. Um, but that's, that's what the Bible says. And, you know, Paul had a thorn in his flesh, and we all do. You know, and I would say, you know, and I would say some... You know, and I would tell them, and I've talked to them because we've talked, and, and they're Christians and they're struggling with this, um, you know, is that like some of the loneliest, hardest times in my life have been when I've been married. And, and we have this thought that if we get to have sex with somebody um, who we're committed to, that like all of a sudden all our problems are solved and like life is great. But that's not the case. And, and, there's, and we all are experiencing suffering in different ways. Um, but the big thing what I would say is Christians need to begin to approach it in this way and begin to um, soften the hostility. Um, because like, one of the things I've been amazed with with talking with students and also in kind of doing research that I was doing on the homosexuality thing is all of your churches have multiple people who are attracted to the same sex. Like, they are, like, that, that I think a lot of people would say that the, the amount of not-out homosexuals are, is way bigger than the amount of people who have come out of the closet and said we're homosexual or we struggle with a same-sex attraction. It's everywhere. And, um, and so just to be cautious about what you're saying and who you're saying it to, and are you the kind of youth group? Are you the kind of small group? Or do you have the kind of friendships where if one of your friends 
is struggling with this, they'll feel okay talking to you about it. You know, is this something that we can begin to talk about and not kind of bury, um, and, you know, and by the way, uh, let me look at, um, sorry, I'm trying to find my notes here. Uh, and uh, here's, here's like 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, in other words, people who try to manipulate people, con people, will inherit the kingdom of God. And if you look at that list, um, one of the things that I found very frustrating is churches don't really talk about greed that much compared to homosexuality. Uh, honestly, and, and it's funny, it's kind of like, and here's what I've found, is that like, in like small groups, it's like, people go around and like, there'll be like five guys struggling with pornography and masturbation, and everybody will be, that's right, I said that word, uh, and everybody will be like, and everybody will be like, oh man, that's fine, you know, we all struggle with that, but if one person says they struggle with homosexuality, it is like, everybody freaks out. Well, that's not biblical. That's not biblical. Like, again, these are all a list of sins. You know, that, and we need to begin to seeing them all at the same time. And, and like, you know, and I think a lot of people, things have been written about why gay marriage has come to the forefront. And, um, and I completely agree. Uh, gay marriage is seen as fine because heterosexual marriage isn't worth anything. M- you know, m- the majority of heterosexual marriages don't last. Uh, churches and the state do not go after people who get divorces. Um, so we need to kind of, before we really start to launch onto homosexuality, and marriage, we need to kind of like deal with heterosexual marriage as well and see them as equal issues because they're both problems. Does that make sense? Um, now, is that, is that there anything you share there part of that series you did that other seminar? What? The homosexuality? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like I have it, um, and I have a handout, and unfortunately I'm trying to get it put on like my iTunes thing, um, but the recording was not as good as I want to, so... I'm trying to work with that. Um, but yeah, I did, I, did, I did dating sex marriage last semester at UTC, so got to talk about all sorts of things like this. Um, well, we're kind of uh, basically out of time, so I'm sorry I didn't get to everything on y'all's list. I kind of got to the ones that were the most prevalent. Um, so um, the other questions, I mean, we don't have to leave. We've gone a little over time. If y'all have other questions, anything pressing that y'all want to talk about. Um, but I just, I just would say we do need to... Um, we just need to be open uh, that like homosexuality you know, is here to stay um, but I really think looking at these categories is helpful because people uh, I mean I think more and more people are um, you know, born, be, born being attracted to the same sex and it is going to be a very very difficult life for them as they struggle to not act out on it just like it's, a very, it's hard for all of y'all to not act out on your attractions until you're married and this is what we're all called to do, and we need to have them be able to dialogue with us as well and not keep them out of Christian fellowship and, and talking through it. Because, I, because what I found is there are way more Christians who are struggling with this than there are Christians who have just, or people who have just said, I'm going to be homosexual. Um, that, that there are a lot of Christians who are really struggling with this, really trying to figure out what the Bible says about them. And so we need to, we need to love them and be open um, to dialoguing with them. So, anyway. Thanks, all.